one of the costs of a, of a crisis is going to be loss in confidence. So one of the issues is how do you measure investor confidence? If I'm looking at a country that's experienced a crisis, I can't tell if savings has gone down or people are not participating in financial markets because they've lost confidence or because they just have less wealth. We're going to look at the financial decisions of immigrants in the U.S. I'm going to argue that the effects I see here are going to be largely the impact of confidence, not the direct effects of wealth. Immigrants are going to measure their exposure to systemic crises depending on where they came from and when they came. Um, we've got them in a common current environment, right? So institutions are the same, access to the banking structure is more or less the same, or at least to a first approximation the same. So, but if crises have you know, long-lasting and important effects on confidence, then they might affect financial decisions even for immigrants in the U.S. Um, and then we're gonna, we have to be worried, though, that the decision to migrate is somehow related to crisis exposure, and that that's correlated with observables in a way that might also impact your financial behavior. So imagine we start people off at time zero. You have... You know, you can think about this as sort of a Bayesian thing. You have some probability um, of, the, of a bank crisis for person I from country J. Time one, you either experience a crisis or not, and then you might update your belief. Then at time two, we're going to observe this person in the U.S. and see whether or not they have a bank account. The outcome we've decided to focus on is whether or not you have a checking account. We have individual data from the 1996 survey of income and program participation. So this is a big U.S. data set. So the data we're going to look at have 3,644 immigrants from 91 countries who arrived in the U.S. after 1975 and for at least 18 at the time of the survey. We've got detailed socioeconomic data. We've got education, age, family structure, the county they're living in in the U.S., income, wealth, and then a bunch of information about what, which financial markets we're using um, confidential data from the, um, from the census, which tells us the year of arrival in the US and the county of residence. The bank crisis data that we use come from Honohan and Raven, who put together this, this sort of enormous data set with 105 countries. It covers 1975 to 2002, and they document 60 systemic crises. There's some other information which includes the length of the crisis and the severity of the crisis measured as uh, the percent of GDP. So they have that for some of those things and we'll look at that as well. Then we're going to pull in some other cross-country data from various sources. We're going to measure crisis exposure two ways. So the first way is just going to be, one, if you live through a crisis. So if you migrated from a country that had a crisis after there was a crisis, then we're going to count you as exposed to the crisis. The other thing we're going to look at is how old you were at the time the crisis started. What you see is that people who live through a systemic bank crisis are about 11 percentage points less likely to have a checking account in the U.S. compared to other people from the same country you know, with the same characteristics. <coughs> We'd like to be able to control for the time of migration. We can't do that completely obviously because our, our variable is measuring, measured off of when you migrated. The migration literature is very concerned about differential migration selection through time. When we <coughs> use the age at crisis measure of, of crisis exposure, then we can also include um, controls for the decade of migration. So now we're looking at people who were and were not, or sorry, who were exposed to the crisis at different ages, but who migrated within the same decade. So when you have all the controls in there, it's Age at crisis, for, for every year older you are, you're about 0.3 percentage points less likely to have a checking account. So if you were 10, 3 percentage points less, 3 percentage points less likely, by doing the math right, times 10. And if you were 30, 10 percentage points less likely. What you see is that the effect of living through a crisis is really concentrated among immigrants with low education. So this is less than high school education. When we look at how long you've been in the U.S., for each additional year that you've been in the U.S., the effect of living through a crisis goes down a little bit by about a percentage point, or less than a percentage point. And then again, when you look at recent migrants, so these are people who've come uh, within three, three years of the survey, you can see that the effect of having lived through a crisis is much larger for them.
so they've had less time to sort of have experience with U.S. institutions and maybe update their beliefs about how, how banks and other institutions work. And then when we look at the impact of people who are naturalized citizens in the U.S., we don't find any effect here. The impact of living through a crisis is smaller for people who come from countries that are more developed. And here we measure GDP per capita, average GDP per capita over a 10-year period. So we're just trying to get kind of general level of development. Um, it's not significant, but it looks like you know, countries that have more developed financial systems, that that would mitigate the crisis effect a little bit. Um, and then we also looked at some measures of uh, the penetration of banking in the country of origin, so the number of bank branches per capita. We didn't find any effect there. Now that could work two ways. That could be a measure of the level of financial development, but it could also be a measure of financial market participation in the country of origin. We don't, we don't find any effect, though, of, of the number of bank branches per capita um, or in bank freedom. And coming from a place with good institutions seems to kind of wipe out the negative effect of living through a crisis. But what looks like happens is that you know, just a banking crisis by itself lowers your participation in checking accounts by about 6%. But if there's also a GDP crisis at the same time, so some very severe contraction, then that's adding to this effect. Um, when we look to see you know, how low was GDP growth during the crisis, we don't find any differential effect by how bad things got in terms of GDP growth in the country. We also don't find anything significant in terms of how long the crisis lasts. Okay, so you would think maybe that longer crises have bigger impacts, but you know, there's just nothing significant here, so it's possible that we can't tell. Now, if the country has deposit insurance in place before the crisis starts, then this negative effect is, is canceled out. So it seems to be, you know, banking crisis affects your confidence in banks, but doesn't seem to spill over to you know, the financial sector altogether. We don't find different results if we drop low wealth or low income immigrants. So if you came to the US and lived someplace where a whole bunch of banks were shut down in that state, did that impact, you know, was that one of the things that was driving your banking behavior? That didn't seem to have any impact on these immigrants or on, on people living in the US, which is you know consistent with what we found about deposit insurance as well. It doesn't look like you know, that this um, that if a crisis that happens in your country of origin once you're in the U.S. affects your behavior. We still have to be worried that our crisis exposure variable is picking up not just investor confidence, but something unobservable that's correlated with having lived through a crisis. So we try to control for this by looking at checking accounts, because we think unobservables are going to be less of a big deal there. We drop Mexico, so one of the countries that we think is going to be you know, most likely to be exposed by this. And then the other thing we've looked at is sort of said, well, we obviously can't look at unobservables directly. But let's see if observables are different for people who live through a crisis or not. There's no significant difference between people who've been exposed to crises or not exposed to crises in wealth, education, income, or labor force status. But there is for age and things that are correlated with age, like the kids you have marital status. And we also looked at data from the INS, or the Department of Homeland Security, or whoever they are now, that looks at legal flows of legal immigrants into the US for big migration sending countries. And we tried to see if there was a systematic pattern. You know, When there was a banking crisis, did migration go up or did it go down? And we didn't find anything significant there. There are different patterns for different places. But if you run regressions, you don't pick up something significant in terms of explaining flows. So, so that's what we've been able to do to try to deal with this unobservable issue. And so it does look like this issue of people diverting savings away from the formal financial sector is probably an important cost of a systemic bank crisis and something that we should be concerned about. Deposit insurance looks like a good way to mitigate those issues. 